Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Rebuild SoCal Zone. It's a beautiful day here in Anaheim, and it's the first week of spring. We have an exceptional guest here today. Please welcome the CEO and co-founder of BizFed, Tracy Hernandez. Hi, John. Hey. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks for that Hi, rousing there. round of applause. That's a, that's a way to put a smile on my face. Tracy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at BizFed? Well, thanks, John. I appreciate you asking. I'm always happy to talk about what got me to today and uh, teaming up with Rebuild SoCal Partnership. I uh, grew up in southern Idaho, and in Twin Falls, Idaho is where I got the bug to be in the news business. And so I started in the daily newspaper business while I was still in high school. And who knew that was going to lead to my actual full life of running daily newspapers. And from there, I ran newspapers in Salt Lake City and St. Louis and the Philadelphia markets up into New England and Providence and Boston areas, and then owned my own newspaper company in Washington State. And that's what brought me to Los Angeles back in 2002 to be the publisher and CEO of the Los Angeles Daily News. From there, as you know, the daily newspaper business and 24-7 news media had changed extensively. And I had the privilege of being through navigating those changes with the advent of the internet and how news and information was consumed, how people learned of their communities' issues and strengths and then were empowered to do something about it. And that's what led to starting BizFed or the LA County Business Federation. David Fleming was a friend and a mentor of mine, a civic philanthropist for a long time in the greater LA area. And then when I left the newspaper business, he had the concept around getting business owners more civically active and organized so that they could have a stronger voice in public policy, all levels of government. And it was funny, that actually resonated with me when I left the daily newspaper business. I had a, an idea about kind of next stage of the media business and equipping people who employ people to engage more civically. So it was very harmonious in 2007, got together and posed the idea to the broader business community. What if we not start another business group, but what if we got all the existing business groups and all their very diverse views and sectors and size of companies organized into one federation? Could we have more impact on positive economic public policies coming out of every level of government. So whether that's at our city council, at the county supervisors, at the state level, the federal level, regulatory boards and agencies and such. And the response was a big resounding yes. And you'll appreciate this because you're a combination of organizing labor voices and business voices to make a difference around infrastructure in Southern California. And we actually took a page right out of labor's playbook. So there was the Los Angeles County Labor Federation, or the Labor Fed, and we said they're doing a great job getting their views heard and recognized by lawmakers and policymakers. Why don't we just do the same thing and get employers more civically active? And hence, then BizFed was born in January of 2008. And I can say that today, a minor miracle is happening. We have 215 different distinct business organizations. So that's like city chambers of commerce, industry trade groups, minority business groups, women business groups, business improvement districts, you name it, all officially agreed and committed to work together to understand the things that drive our economy and how we can get more active with government at all levels of government and have a voice. And so, as you know, we've been with you since your inception, or you've been with us. We've been together trying to make yep. a difference. So Southern California's yeah. jobs grow and our infrastructure is built better and we tackle homelessness and poverty and all the things that are needed, clean our air and the like. So here we are today, about 455,000 companies are represented through those 215 business groups and employing about 4 million people here in SoCal. One last thing I'd say, you know, it, concept isn't easy. You guys know this because you live it every day. Naturally, all these groups compete with one another, um, all these sectors and regions and so on. 
But the fact that they choose to work together on occasion to have bigger impact, so our economy hums and jobs grow, incomes grow, and our communities are improved is a model that actually has been replicated now. We have a BizFed Central Valley. So about three years ago, folks there saw what was happening in LA and said, hey, we want to do that too. So now there's a thriving BizFed Central Valley that's organized the counties from Kern County to Madera County. There's five of them and 44 cities. And They have a fully functioning BizFed there too. So the idea is taking root. The impact is demonstrable. And, you know, every day we work hard to make a difference. Tracy, thank you so much for that update and your background. It's impressive. And like you said earlier, Rebuild saw right off the bat the upside to belonging to BizFed. So as soon as we could jump on it, we did. And this actual partnership has been very fulfilling for us. It has, you know, you guys are, the thing I really, of course, appreciate so much is that your keen sensibility around how you communicate to the public and you use the news media to raise important issues in regular terms that people get and they understand why it matters. And you also bring disparate and different voices to the table. And that's, of course, what we're all about. So I think our alliance, the way we help each other understand what's happening in real time and then educate and mobilize people to speak up and not be afraid, but actually show them how the lawmakers, our elected officials really do want to hear from regular citizens, regular business owners, regular workers about what impacts their daily lives so they can also make better decisions. So we like working with you. Well, Tracy, we enjoy working with you too, and we're happy to have you today. You know, I really thought, for those that don't know about BizFed, I thought it would be important today to talk about the Sacramento Week. You just had the third annual Sacramento Week. Of course, it was done virtually this year, but what a fantastic panel, topics of discussion. I really thought some of what came out of that and talking with the legislators and those that are setting policy in Sacramento, you had some of the biggest hitters up there that are making a difference. And the sessions that you had, I would like to talk about today. So there's one, it was the first one we talked about and I learned so much. I was able to attend, which was my first time attending. It won't be my last because it was very inspiring and also so educational. Maybe talk a little bit about how Sacramento Wake came about for BizFed, what the importance was and why that was important for your group. And then also maybe we can discuss some of the main topics that came out because there is policy being written for some of the top five topics. So maybe a little background on how this was created. Sure, Carol. Happy to do that. We've discovered that over the years, as I mentioned, we work at all levels of government, but we've seen in the past few years, the state is really trying to tackle a lot of important issues and the volume of bills that our state assembly members and state senators author, as you know, ranges in the thousands, usually from 2,500 to 4,000 bills get introduced each legislative session. And then we have the governor accepting those bills that make it through or not. And then they're building and passing a state budget. So the state lawmakers, of course, have tremendous impact on all of us as individuals, us as business owners, and they also have a lot of impact on local government, the local cities and counties as well. So what happened was as our members were bringing forward more and more state legislation, our business leaders in all different sectors kept coming to this conclusion. We need to get involved sooner, earlier, ahead of time, as the state lawmakers are introducing and writing their bills, authoring these ideas, The business leaders, business owners, employers should get there sooner rather than waiting till the bill's at the end of the lawmaking process and it's gone through committees and maybe it's at the floor and it's in final decision making or even after the legislature makes its decision and it gets to the governor's desk and we're waiting for that person to sign or veto. And then we engage because it's at that 11th hour. We were finding that was more typical of when people paid attention. So by design, we said, let's get in front of it. And exactly three years ago, we said, why don't we get into the Capitol with the lawmakers at the beginning of the process? So right when they're on bill deadline. So in February every year, end of February, is always the deadline for authors to submit all new legislation. 
And then the sausage making starts after that. So we said, why don't we get to Sacramento in February, right when they're at that stage before they start meeting in committees and deciding what they think about it and hearing from the public and all the different stakeholders and help them understand where we're coming from. What's most important to business owners in Southern California, to their ongoing existence, their ability to grow and compete and survive and thrive here rather than think about doing that other places. So Carol, that's how BizFed Sacramento came about. And, and you'll note three years ago, that was the same time BizFed Central Valley came into being. And we thought, what if we went together? What if business owners in Southern California, greater LA area, went with business owners from the Central Valley who often see the world differently, those two parts of our state. If we could get together and we could speak to lawmakers, maybe that would be helpful to them and then helpful to the economy because they'd have the great intel at the beginning of the lawmaking process. So that's what happened. So three years ago, we start going to the Capitol meeting. We focus on the lawmakers. It really doesn't matter where their district is. We don't just meet with the LA lawmakers or just the Central Valley lawmakers. It was really oriented toward those that had authority. So specifically, the lawmakers who were chairing committees of import on the subject matters that impact us, for example, on transportation, on housing, on energy, on broadband, course, now we're dealing with COVID relief and so on. And that's what we do. So we meet with lawmakers all over the state. If they're in power, if they're running and chairing committees that these bills have to go through, we want to meet with them and have them hear from our stakeholders. And then we're trying to also build relationships for the long run as they're going through their process. And they might be hearing from different voices that confuse them or concern them. They know they can come back to us and we can help give them real time useful information so they can make the best decisions possible. So we're building relationships for the long run as well. Tracy, that that's exactly how it feels though too. In during these discussions, like we always say here at Rebuild SoCal, partnership is, you know, what can we do for you? That's always kind of how we end things because we're in, all in this together and there's no reason why we can't be able to work some things out. Let the public know, let the legislators know how the public truly feels, no matter what sector you're from. I love that we were with Central California, the powers and the numbers. And so when we can all come together on certain subjects, it is powerful. And there's a lot of great information from different parts that you can get different opinions from. So I couldn't agree more. I really couldn't. And I'm from Central California, so I have a little, you know, hey, hey over there. <laughs> I met with our staff and those that were on the Sacramento Week. And I'll tell you, one of the number one topics that we all came away from, we thought the broadband expanding the access and the digital divide resonated with all of us. I think every single one of our staff members from 23 to 56 had an idea about didn't really know what this was going to be about. And we were so pleasantly surprised because not knowing, not really realizing how it's affecting other people in other areas, rural areas that don't have broadband, that don't have Wi-Fi, that don't have the accessibility and the technology to even have their children go to school and be able to learn at home. So, you know, unless you're in that, you're not realizing. So it was a big awareness for us. And I think as we talk more about this, and I, I'd like you to kind of give some highlights, but I will tell you, it wasn't just getting it to them. It's how are we going to build the infrastructure? How are we going to make it affordable? What are the long and short term goals? So it was great to hear from the policymakers that are working on this in Sacramento. I think it was one of the best topics that we could have brought up because it hits everybody. You know, everybody's with that. So any thoughts on that discussion that you came away from, or I know it was important to your members and made your top five. Right. In fact, as you mentioned, Carol, it was the first one. We started with the broadband and closing the digital divide discussion. So I'll tell you what has happened. This topic has been on people's minds for some time, but COVID really accelerated it. It moved it to almost the top issue, no matter what lens or how you look at your own life, your own business, your own community. Because what happened during COVID, we all had to go remote. So work had to become remote, medicine, so your healthcare had to become remote, and your learning, all your schooling, education, no matter what grade or level you were at, had to become remote. So we had telehealth, telelearning, telework. 
became the norm for most people in California and the nation, really. So what that did was shed light on problems and opportunities that have been talked about for some time, but became now mission critical. And as you mentioned, you know, kids, whether they're, you know, kindergarten, first, second, third grade, or they're middle school, high school, or college students, all were faced with how do we learn and pivot and all the complexities. It really doesn't matter whatever age you're at. I have kids, and so I'm dealing with it too. That digital learning and reliable internet access at your home and dealing with your computer and all of that became so important. And then, of course, healthcare, people's lives, you know, life and death, real situations in healthcare. And you had to do it primarily through telemedicine. People were so afraid to go to hospital or healthcare facility because it was ground zero for COVID, a very deadly virus. And of course, in the earlier days too, we didn't know as much about how to treat it. So having the basic tenement of healthcare, having to be remote and then have to rely on, do you have access for the internet and broadband, either on your phone or computer, so you could talk to your nurse or your doctor. And of course, work. You know, all I know, you guys were the same. We pivoted back in March a year ago, and immediately overnight, we do everything 100% work remote. So it shed light that, believe it or not, you know, in California, the most creative, innovative state in the nation and this part of the, for the whole world, really is there's glaring gaps. And you mentioned rural, that's for sure. But also this shed light on urban. Surprisingly, even urban areas have gaps. And so, and the gaps are different. Sometimes it's infrastructure. Literally, there isn't enough, the right kind or enough infrastructure to have enough broadband access to every single home is what we're talking about in every single business, every single entity, agency, public and private. But the other one was affordability. Of course, as you know, dealing with poverty, we have a huge anti-poverty initiative at BizFed, so we work on it all the time, lifting people out of poverty, and that ties into dealing with homelessness and housing affordability and, and all the like. But you just had people who couldn't afford it, just plain cannot afford, you know, a cell phone or, or reliable broadband access. So you now see the amount of bills running this session to tackle it. You see counties do, running, um, LA County and others, they're running initiatives to deal with it. The cities are dealing with it. President Biden in the national level, the latest Recovery Stimulus Act has a huge part of broadband. So it is now front and center on everyone's mind because we can't solve all the other problems without getting to the core. Now, what we're learning, though, is, of course, everyone has a lot of different ideas about how to solve the problem. And now that there's a ton of money moving to solve the problem, that really gets people's attention. And I'm sure, Carol, you saw that, too. That's why when there's money, then people pay attention even more, <laughs> whether they should have paid attention before or not. But now... Tracy, it takes a crisis. That's really what it, Yeah. <laughs> whether it's money or something else, but it takes a crisis to get everybody to pay attention. It does. And now that we have this moment and money to pay attention, we need to make really smart decisions. And so at BizFed, we have a BizFed Institute in addition to BizFed. So BizFed's an advocacy organization. So we speak up and we get engaged in policy. We have an institute though, that's a C3 nonprofit foundation. It's about more of getting even more players that aren't just business owners to the table to really solve the most pressing community issues around thinking and gathering input. And so our institute is right now, they've been working on it for quite a while and it really surfaced last year during COVID. And so they're standing up the Los Angeles, Orange County Regional Broadband Consortium, believe it or not. This is a statewide program that's been in existence for over a decade. And there, are, every county in the state can have a regional broadband consortia. And it's funded you know, by state legislation, state government, and so on, to really get down into the weeds, really grassroots level, mapping specific neighborhoods that have gaps in broadband access, and then get about solving those problems primarily through infrastructure, but also through access and affordability. And here's the believe it or not, L.A. County doesn't even have 
an existing consortia, nor does Orange County. Orange County's never had one. LA's had it in the past, but that group had a bankruptcy. And so then they were just left unattended and other applications tried and weren't approved by the Public Utilities Commission. So bottom line is zero's happening in Los Angeles County and Orange County. And so we stepped in, um, BISFED Institute and BISFED, and have filed an application to restart that and to get all jurisdictions, so all the 88 cities in the county of LA and all the cities in Orange County, County, including the boards of education. This is a come one, come all, everyone to the table. Everyone focused on disadvantaged communities as a primary intent. And so the equity lens comes into play. And then how do we work far and wide with all elements, including the internet providers themselves, including government, including community groups and business groups and educators. And so there's going to be some real meat on the bone convening all these stakeholders to solve problems together. So that's in the works. The LA Orange County Regional Broadband Consortium being stood up, which is great. The second thing that's happening, of course, I mentioned the stimulus funds. So American Recovery Act and others, those are going to cities right now. And those cities are deciding how to spend it. And then there's a whole lot of bills running at the state level. There's this one issue around infrastructure. And the fact is that FCC at the federal level set a cost structure that cities can charge to get small cells put up in their cities all around town. And if they cap the fee, it's something like $270. But then there's this piece where cities themselves can come in and then they can raise those prices, even though they're set at the federal level, if they can prove that their costs will exceed that. But what's happened is city by city, even though broadband doesn't have city borders, doesn't have county borders, doesn't even have state borders, but city by city, they're setting these costs. And we're hearing ranging not the 270, but in some cities up to $4,000 per poll. And then they wonder why they don't have access in the poorest part of their communities and urban areas. And then of course, the rural areas. So that's something we're trying to work on is leveling the field, get all the cities and jurisdictions to agree to expedite, set reasonable costs, uniform the costs, and then pave the way. Just let the private sector spend all the money. Then government and the taxpayers don't need to spend the money to do it. The private sector will if they make it feasible and reasonable to get at it. So those are just some near-term things that are happening right now in the next few months. Well, needless to say, your bucket of things to do is overflowing, all good for our industry in general, and glad that there's a voice there, and quite candidly, people looking over the fence to see where we should be going. Having said that, maybe in bullet form, what is BizFed looking at for 21 and 22? I guess I'll give you the bullets and and sectors real quick, and we can decide what you want to drill down into, but the Transportation is always top of mind. I think, John, you know, because you participate in it, your group does every year, we poll. So we get real-time intel on companies of all sizes and shapes. What's near term, like you were just asking me, what's this year and next year? And so we ask those questions. And transportation is always at the top of the heap because why? Why would business owners put that as a top five? Is that we have to get our employees to and from work. We have to get our goods and services to our customers, and we have to do all of that efficiently and affordably, right? So the transportation infrastructure is always key. The other one is water, which I know doesn't always come top of mind, but water in the state of California is mission critical. So new sources of water, reliable sources of water, we work with you on a lot of these issues. We have some new sources such as the Cadiz Water Project in the High Desert, the Poseidon Desalination Project in Orange County, and we have the state water project, the one tunnel system that Metropolitan Water District just approved recently to keep funding the environmental impact report on and the governor's a part of. So I'd say water obviously is the lifeblood to all people and businesses in California, so we can't ever lose sight on that. The other thing is on energy. Energy sources, reliable and affordable, again, too, kind of like water. So there is an effort right now in California that we're having to engage on, not that we want to, but it's a real thing, is there's 
some folks that just think we should ban all oil and gas extraction and production. And that is, while we 100% stand behind achieving climate goals, we understand climate change is very important, very real. We need to clean our air and waters and deal with that and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But right now, it's so short-sighted to say California that can produce and does produce its own oil and gas to fuel our vehicles and our homes and our businesses and just say, let's stop doing that locally and instead let's ship it in from halfway around the world. Obviously, that puts a bigger carbon footprint in the world to say, let's not extract it here, but let's bring it in from Venezuela or Saudi Arabia or et cetera. When the consumers in California, the demand is such and the equipment, technology, buildings and so on are such that we're still importing 60% of our fuel needs. And rather than do it here, California has, as you know, the strictest um, environmental standards of anywhere on the earth. We lead the world on that, which is great. It's good. And so it, to me, it's better. And to us, let's get our energy sources extracted under the toughest greenhouse gas and climate change and safety regulations that exist on the planet. Do it here locally. Keep the jobs here locally. Keep the reduced greenhouse gases by not having to ship it around halfway around the world keep the cost down and affordable so that everyone can afford their energy. And then, of course, let's keep the lights on and not have brownouts and such that people lose all the food in the refrigerator, businesses lose lines of production on products that they're creating, and so on, brownouts happen. So those are some, some big issues. Just a quick little interjection here. Since you brought up energy, maybe... Just a quick little idea. We saw that SoCal Gas made a climate commitment announcement yesterday, I believe it was, the 23rd. I just thought, you know, now that they're looking at a full commitment that's going to reduce their company direct emissions and then those that generated by customers. So this means not only will the trucks we drive, the buildings we own, and the pipelines we operate make this transition, but also the fuel we deliver to our customers will be net zero emissions by 2045. The question I have in reading this, where is this going to fit in with this all electric world that everybody's trying to make happen? If everybody's committed to making their climate resolutions and to make it happen, why can't we have a little bit of everything? Why does it have to be pushed in one direction? Right, Carol. We all agree with you 100% that I think people will evolve with knowledge and information and technology. The regulators and rule makers have to evolve. We cannot put all our eggs in one basket. You saw what happened in Texas and other places. You cannot rely on any one source, whatever it is, because people's safety, livelihood, health, as well as their businesses and our economy are tied to reliable and affordable energy. And so it needs to be an all hands on deck. Just you mentioned the gas company's commitment. That is amazing. That's total compliance with the Paris Climate Accord. And to start using more hydrogen and renewable natural gas, and it's all net zero, that then solves the problem. I think some people only had what they thought was maybe one solution, which was electric. And of course, then people dig into, I mean, we need more electric, we need more battery storage, but then there's a whole lot of issues that we have to do to support that. And it's not, the whole supply chain isn't carbon free, as people know, a lot of electricity is generated by natural gas. And so to me, it's always been what's been at my heart and soul is truthful, valuable, real-time information, because once you have that, then everyone makes better decisions with it. So we definitely need, just like in transportation, we need multiple solutions that are comprehensive in energy. We need multiple solutions that are comprehensive that all get us to the goal, right? So keep our eye on the right prize, like you said, which is net zero. And then there's a lot of different ways to get from here to there. And every day people are creating. It has to make sense. It does. You know what I mean? It has to make sense. It has to make sense. I mean, some of the things that are being talked about in terms of policy making do not make any sense. We don't have product that's even developed yet to meet some of these goals. So it really does have to make sense. And we, I think collectively as a group, if we continue these conversations and bringing businesses and biz fed groups, this is how it's going to happen. So I don't really see how else it's not, you know, the public needs to know what's going on. 
They do. They do. And, and, you know, there's, again, on the issues of when you said the technology doesn't exist yet and so on. It's like in, in the world of trucks, you know, Southern California is the gateway to the world, right? So everyone, we've all been sitting at home using Amazon and buying our e-commerce and everything online, having it delivered right to our house. Well, all that stuff comes through our ports, ports of LA and Long Beach. And then for, I think it's 40% of all the goods in the country move from here out to the rest of the country. So logistics, right, is a huge goods movement supply chain, a big part of, I think it's one in eight jobs in Southern California tied to that. So then in the trucking world, you can say, let's stay focused on clean the air, get clean trucks. So then you'd say, right now, technology exists to have renewable natural gas vehicles, to have hydrogen vehicles. So a lot of near zero, which is like 99% clean. And we could get those in mass on the ground, whether it's public owned trucks, private owned trucks, company owned trucks, whatever. And get those out now and clean the air now. Or you have people sitting on the line saying, no, it's zero only. And those engines for heavy-duty trucks don't exist today. You, even if you wanted to buy one, you couldn't buy one because they're not there yet. And so it does blow your mind as people who say, well, it's all or nothing, but all doesn't even exist yet. Why wouldn't we go and spend the next 10, 20 years radically cleaning all of our fleet and then 20 30 years from now go to the next level when it does exist and just keep going right it's a constant pursuit of greatness that we all need and you know we can meet our climate goals now and let's like you said have all the solutions come to the table adopt them as soon as they're available and keep moving and and not be ridiculous about just closing your eyes to reality First of all, I, once again, we are thrilled to have another educational podcast. We are amazed and blessed by getting people like you on so we can discuss these important issues from a, from a logical point of view, kind of boots on the ground world. Before we close, do you have any last comments? Well, the last comments are get involved, stay involved, pay attention, speak up. You know, I think that's really it. And it doesn't matter who you are. If you employ yourself, you employ one person or you employ 1,000 people, 20,000 people, your voice matters. We we find generally that people are running companies, running businesses, employing people, risking everything they've got to uh, have their enterprise go. They tend to be more afraid of government. And we're trying to break down those barriers. Don't be afraid. Get hooked up with the Rebuild SoCal Partnerships, the BizFeds, the Chambers, the your different trade associations, and they'll help you along the way. And they'll break down those barriers because your voice does matter. And just speaking up from your own personal view doesn't, again, if you run you're self-employed or you have a couple of people or a lot of people, how you see the world and sharing the challenges that you have to compete, to grow, to stay afloat here in Southern California, your voice matters. So get involved, go to bizfed.org. We can help you go to, you know, I know Rebuild SoCal Partnership. You guys have a great website. And so that's my last thing is to get involved. Speak up. Thank you. That concludes today's episode on Rebuild SoCal Zone. Thank you for listening, and a huge thank you to Tracy Hernandez and Carol for joining us today. Make sure to subscribe to all of our channels so you can tune in again next month with another fantastic guest. Take care, everyone.